Okay, folks, good afternoon. Uh, I had a chance to grade quiz number five, I believe. I'm not going in any particular order. I know quiz number four has not been graded yet. And if you look at the grading center, it's a mess because once I create a column, I cannot rename it, I cannot move it, I can't do anything with it. So I think the order of the grades are like column associated with quiz four is after quiz five. So, but it doesn't really matter at the end because all of the quizzes have equal weights and all the homework assignments have equal weights. Also, um, um, the sign-up sheet is actually circulating in addition to the homework, uh, to the quiz. Um, any questions? Okay, so what we did, oh, uh, regarding next week, the quiz for next week, which is going to be, I believe, our last quiz, quiz number six, I believe it's our last quiz. Uh, the topic to be covered is matrix converters, okay? Matrix converters for quiz six. Um, what we did last time was we wrapped up the discussion on matrix converters and then we started a new kind of a topic which is power factor correction. So power factor correction becomes important when we have a nonlinear load and as it turns out in power electronics we have a lot of nonlinear loads. So the whole idea is in addition to the, if our source is a purely sinusoidal source, voltage source, in addition to, if you, if you actually look at the current that is uh, you know, being supplied to your load, and if you have a nonlinear load, in addition to your fundamental uh, harmonic, you have a bunch of undesired harmonics. And these, are, these harmonics are not good in a sense that they may saturate the local distribution transformer. They may actually add some, um, you know, add some losses to that transformer, some core losses and they actually may introduce some extra conduction losses, things like that. Uh, so there, there should be some method for us to either attenuate or eliminate those undesired harmonics. So we kind of classify different approaches to condition power, basically, mostly AC power. And the particular ones that we are interested in is this category, category down here, power factor correctors. And we haven't actually introduced any topologies or anything yet. Hopefully today we will. But um, first, we did take a look at um, an example for a nonlinear load, which is a full bridge rectifier. So if you remember from power electronics, if you use these four bridges, four diodes, to form a bridge and then rectify the AC power, um, the output voltage is this blue line over here, which is the voltage across this capacitor. And then the conduction of the diodes or the input current is non-zero when uh, the blue, which is the output voltage, overlaps with our rectified version of our input voltage or the absolute value of the input voltage. So we have a, actually a spike of current in this you know, a time period and then nothing, then another a spike of current in a negative way in the other half cycle. So as you can see, the current that is drawn from the AC source is not sinusoidal. It's not even in phase with the sinusoidal system. So you would expect this to have a very low power factor, like maybe 30%, 40%. So now it is uh, actually up to us to come up with some approaches to actually improve this situation, make the, our input current closer to a sinusoidal current. All right, so let me go to the new date. Any questions so far? So we are kind of trying to introduce the, co the topic, the concept. Um, first thing that we are going to do is we are going to define a bunch of basically mathematically defined bunch of parameters. So if you want to compare one topology versus other, we can use these you know, definitions to actually look at their performances. Well, obviously, we are talking about power factor, so let's have a definition for power factor. It is defined as active power
divided by apparent power. Okay, so active power is like if you have a, resistive, a resistor as your load, is the amount of heat that is going to be actually generated. So it's the real power. So remember active power, uh, I'm assuming that we are dealing with sinusoidals, uh, with, with periodic signals. We look at one period of the voltage or current, assuming that they are the same, and they are usually the same. And then uh, you look at your input voltage, instantaneous value, look at your input current, instantaneous value, multiply them by each other, and then take the average value. So that's your, apparent, your active power. And the apparent power is basically the RMS value of the input voltage times the RMS value of the input current. Again, we are assuming that our input voltage and input currents are periodic signals, and they are basically a lot of times. Okay, so this is actually V in RMS, and this is I in RMS. Okay. Now remember, this is very general <coughs> in a sense that we are not actually making the assumption that our input voltage is sinusoidal. We are just assuming they are periodic signals. They could be, a, they could be actually a square-shaped or trapezoidal periodic signals. However, if our input voltage is sinusoidal, which is the case when we are dealing with the power grid, then your power factor <coughs> equation could be a little bit simplified. It ends up with I1 RMS over I RMS, or I in RMS. Times cosine of phi. Okay, so if your input voltage, in addition to be uh, periodic, it is also sinusoidal, which is also periodic, then your, your top equation will be simplified to the ratio between I1 RMS, I1 is the fundamental harmonic of your input current, to IN, the total RMS value of the input current, times cosine of phi, and phi is actually the phase shift between I1 and Vn. So this is the, f okay, phi is the phase shift <coughs> or phase angle between I1, and by the way, I1 is the fundamental harmonic. So if you look at this equation, there are two kind of factors in it. One is I1 over IN RMS, I1 RMS over IN RMS, which is basically telling us if our input current is distorted or not. Is it really purely sinusoidal or not? And we call it kind of like a form factor, okay? Um, or a the basically harmonic content of the current. And then cosine of phi is telling us if our current is actually in phase with the voltage or not. So there is also a kind of a displacement factor here. So there are two, these two factors are kind of multiplied by each other. So um, KD is kind of representing the distortion in the current or harmonic content.
in the current. And then K sub phi is <coughs> basically displacement angle. Okay, between the current and the voltage. Okay, so two, there are two, there are two actually parameters involved. Um, now, a lot of times you hear that um, they call cosine of phi as the as the power factor, and that is again assuming that our input voltage is sinusoidal and also our current is purely sinusoidal. So if everything is sinusoidal, both the input voltage and the input current, then K sub D will be 1. And all that is remaining is just the phase angle between the current and the voltage. So if Vn and In are both purely sinusoidal, So it is, it is at your discretion which one of these expressions to use. The very comprehensive one on top doesn't make any assumptions other than our signals are periodic. Then the, the, the second one over here, which is assuming that our input voltage is sinusoidal, but we don't know much about the current. Current has some harmonic content in it. And then finally, the very last one is when the input voltage is sinusoidal, the current is also sinusoidal, they are purely sinusoidal signals. And the only thing that is actually missing up with our power factor is the phase angle between the current and the voltage. Um, by the way, when it comes to I in RMS or any, any I RMS, let me just generally write it I RMS. We are looking at a signal that is periodic and has a bunch of harmonics, for instance, a fundamental harmonic. then a second harmonic, and so on and so forth. So if the harmonic content of a signal, a periodic signal, is provided to you, you can just plug them over here. So look at each particular uh, harmonic content, and look at the RMS value of them, and then get the square value of them, and then add them together, and then take the square root of the whole thing. That would be the RMS value of the overall signal once you add them all together. So this was one definition. The other one is the, the total harmonic distortion. So this is our definition for the total harmonic distortion. Total harmonic distortion is an indicator uh, indicator that um, what is the significance of our non-ideal components with respect to the desired component. So the desired component in the current is the fundamental harmonic. And the, the, the one on top is actually the things that we don't want to see. So ideally, you would like to have a total harmonic distortion of 0 or very, very small. At the same time, you would like to have a power factor of 1, which is close to ideal case. Uh, so these are you have seen these definitions before. Sometimes they get a little bit confusing. Uh, like your, your, your current signal is not even sinusoidal, then you, you assume that cosine of phi is your power factor, which is not correct. So just remember which, which one to use when. Uh, to clarify that just a little bit, uh, let's take a look at some examples. So presume you have um, an input voltage that is purely sinusoidal. 
and your car looks like this, for instance, kind of like the rectifier example. All right. In this case, as you can see, your current is distorted. So k sub d is less than 1. At the same time, there is a phase angle between the fundamental harmonic of the current and the voltage. So even k sub phi is not 1. So uh, typically, in cases like this, you get a power factor of about 0.5 and a total harmonic distortion for this particular rectifier, uh, bridge, bridge rectifier, is about 172 percent. Very large. Then consider another case, another example, that your input, current, your input voltage is sinusoidal, but then your input current is a square shape. This happens when you have a rectifier, and to filter out the components of the current, you have added a very large inductor on the path of that current. So your inductor current is almost continuous. Then when it is reflected to the primary side, it is like a square shape, basically. And it is in phase with the voltage. In this case, you can see your current is not sinusoidal. So there, it is distorted. So k sub d is less than 1. But it is in phase with the voltage, so k sub phi is 1. So in cases like this, you get a power factor of about 90% and a total harmonic distortion of 47%. Okay, so a square-shaped signal, rectangular signal has a total harmonic distortion of 47%. Then sometimes, another example, this is your voltage, and this is your current. So this happens, for instance, when you have used a passive filter, a very good passive filter, and your current is actually sinusoidal, but the only problem is it is not in phase with the input voltage. So as you can see, your current is sinusoidal, so k sub d is 1. But it is not in phase with the voltage, so k sub phi is less than 1. In cases like this, like here, that they, ha they are 30 de de degrees apart, you get a power factor of about 87%, and the total harmonic distortion is 0, because your current is purely sinusoidal. And then the ideal case would be having a voltage waveform like this and having a current waveform like this. It is sinusoidal, and it is in phase with the voltage. So uh, KD is 1, and also K sub phi is 1. So power factor is 1, and THD is 0. OK. So these are four examples. So the very one on the left is easy because you don't need to have a power factor corrector. So if you are trying to minimize the cost of your power electronic system, you would like to go with the one on the left. But then the utility companies would like to have the one on the right because current is very purely sinusoidal and is in phase with the voltage. So then you have to kind of find a compromise between the two, two sides of the spectrum. Um, so adding a power factor corrector to the system, uh, obviously it adds some cost because you're actually adding an extra converter to the system. Uh, it added, adds to the size of your converter as well as uh, it introduces some losses to the system because it is processing the entire power. Most of the time it is processing the entire power. And then reliability because if the power factor corrector fails, the whole system fails because it has the, the entire power most of the times is processed through uh, the power factor corrector. Um, so to summarize this, so uh, if you using a uh, adva okay advantages and disadvantages, pros and cons. Let's call it just pros and cons.
so higher cost. Lower efficiency. A larger size. And also uh, lower reliability. Okay, so these are obviously uh, the disadvantages. Um, the advantages are voltage distortions are reduced. So you may ask the question, we are processing the car, and how come the voltage distortions are also reduced? The reason is our line has an impedance. So if our current is distorted, then the voltage is going to, at, at different points, I mean, if you measure the voltage, uh, the voltage will be the original voltage minus the voltage drop on the line. And because the current is not sinusoidal, therefore your voltage is also distorted. So right now, for instance, if you get an oscilloscope and measure the voltage of the power outlet right here, it is not really sinusoidal. It's actually distorted. Um, uh, the other advantage would be, um, all of the consumed power is active, so basically reactive power is almost zero. Okay. Uh, the other one is the RMS value of the current is reduced. So the RMS value of the current is actually the fundamental uh, RMS of the fundamental harmonic. And in that case, you can argue that your losses are kind of minimized. Your conduction losses are minimized. And because of all these advantages, you can argue that a, a higher number of loads can be fed. Oops. OK. Um, so a very general overview of a power factor corrector. And now, if you, if you look at the classification that we had last week, let me see if I can bring it all up here. We classified power factor correctors into multi-stage and then single stage. So let's, let's take a look at that and see what, what I meant by that. Okay. So when we when we don't have a power factor corrector, basically what we are doing is we get this AC source and we use a you know kind of a bridge. Yes. I have a question. So if the lower current is flowing, then we need a yeah, less amount of heat sinking devices. Um, heat sink heat sinking devices for the switches. You mean? I mean, um, the, I would say it is not sig significantly different because the, the heat sink that you, you use in your converter itself is a function of conduction losses of your switch, which could be a little bit minimized because of a better power factor, as well as switching losses. So, but I wouldn't say it is significantly lower. So your heat sinks are not going to be reduced, but at the same time, if you have long cables, the conduction of power in those long cables are going to be reduced. So mostly conduction losses. So um, any other questions? So going back to this classification, um, so you have this 
let's say no power factor you know uh, correction approach so you have this bridge rectifier and then a capacitor and a load okay something like this okay now in the double stage approach or multi stage let's call it multi stage or sometimes called double stage so what happens is you have this b bridge rectifier then cascaded with that you add your power factor corrector and this gives you an output voltage that is relatively DC and we are going to see what I mean by relatively DC later once we look at some simulation results. So there is there is a still some ripple on it but as it turns out when we get to the design of a power factor corrector we don't have much of a choice in terms of selecting the level of this voltage. For instance, and we are going to discuss it soon, if your line voltage is like 110 volts RMS, this voltage on the output side of the, on the capacitor side should be larger than the peak value of your input voltage. So like 110 volts RMS gives you about a peak of 155 volts. So this capacitor voltage should be 200 volts. And we are going to see why. So if your objective is to provide power to a load that only needs 5 volts, obviously 200 volts is too much, then you need to have another DC-DC converter. To step down this voltage to what your load needs. Okay? So this is usually, so let's say if this is 110 RMS, this is usually greater than, let's say, 170 volts. OK? And then your load may not be happy with 170, only needs 5 volts, or maybe 400 volts, I don't know, whatever your load needs. Then you need to have another DC-DC converter to kind of condition the voltage level to what your load needs. So as you can see, we have two stages, two converters cascaded with each other, PFC and your DC-DC converter. Obviously, in this case, you are reducing the efficiency a little bit because you are processing power twice. And because of that, there are some papers out there that they are trying to actually combine the functionality of these two converters with, e with each other, and it's called single stage PFC. All right, which, which means instead of having two separate dedicated converters with, you know, one as a PFC, the other one as a DC to DC converter, you kind of combine them together. and then directly connect your load over here. And a lot of times, the single stage converter has some extra kind of energy storage component inside, which is usually a capacitor. So in this case, you can see the system is a little bit less complicated, because instead of using two converters, we have one converter. But then the operation of this converter is more complicated. And then uh, sometimes method, the, the bottom one is, is more actually desirable if you, for instance, are really trying to minimize the cost. Like instead of using two separate switches, you are, you on, you're trying to only use one switch and achieve your goal. And obviously, when you're trying to combine goals with each other, you may not be very successful in achieving both goals to a, to a good degree. So the second approach, does a relatively good job in terms of power factor correction, but not as good as the multi-stage or the double-stage approach. 
So if you want to com compare these approaches with each other, I have a little bit of a table here that is actually comparing them. So the first thing is don't use a PFC at all, OK? So in that case, you, your cost is low. <coughs> your line current is very distorted. And um, your storage capacity, remember we still need this capacity over here as energy storage a little bit. So the voltage <coughs> is fixed. Okay. So your output voltage is always like 110 times the square root of 2 plus um, some ripple. If you use a double stage, your cost is high. Uh, your line current is almost sinusoidal. It's very good. And your, uh, the voltage of this capacitor over here is controlled. You can control it a little bit. By control, I mean the level of the voltage. And if you use single stage, your cost is kind of medium, like halfway between. You are using a converter anyway, but you are not using two independent converters. Uh, your line current meets regulation, but it is not really sinusoidal. And uh, this voltage is, again, not controlled. Okay, I'm talking about the voltage of this kind of capacitor that is being used as an energy storage system. All right, um, any questions? So, so far everything is kind of a straightforward and simple. Yes? Uh, what could be the architecture of the single switch converter inside? The architecture. Um, we are not going to analyze those converters because there is probably, I can think of at least 20 different architectures. Um, you can come up with your own architecture, basically. And then uh, if you are interested, I can actually show you a few of the papers that talk about these different architectures. What we are going to do in this class, we are going to go with the traditional approach of having a separate, dedicated power factor corrector that gives you a voltage that is usually higher than what you need. So then you have to cascade it with another DC-DC converter. Um, I don't know, maybe at the end of the semester, if you have some time, I might actually be able to look at some of the single stage, uh, you know, converters. And that's, not, that's not a bad idea. Let me see how much time we have towards the end. We can actually take a look at one of them at least. Um, any other questions? Okay. So um, let's look at the principles of operation of our power factor corrector. So, so here we have this PFC block. Okay. Why do I call it a resistor emulator? Because if the PFC is doing a good job and our voltage and current are in sync with each other and they, they are both sinusoidal, it is as if our source is only seeing like a resistor basically, right? So a good power factor corrector from the input side, it is like a very ideal resistor, okay? 
So that's why I call it a resistor emulator. So on the, on the on output side, we have this DC voltage. And then we have the load. The load could be the real load, or there could be another converter. And then downstream, we have the load. So I'm labeling this voltage to be V out. And this current to be IX and I load and obviously the difference is the capacitor current IC on the input side a lot of times we still have this bridge rectifier so the job of this bridge rectifier is to get the absolute value of the sinusoidal input voltage so if you look at this voltage from here to here it's the same sinusoidal signal it's just rectified it's like an absolute value and to highlight the fact that this is kind of like, an resi like a, resistive, a resistor emulator, you know, if you look at the input impedance, it sh ideally it should look like just a simple resistor, okay? Representing the power consumed by the load, okay? So let's look at an ideal case. In an ideal case, um, If you measure the input voltage, assuming that it is sinusoidal, and like in an ideal case, you are kind of neglecting the ripple, the switching ripple in the current. So your current is also almost a purely sinusoidal signal. And if you look at the input power, the instantaneous value of the power, which is just the input voltage at any given time, times the input current. It is actually a sinusoidal signal. Let me see if I can draw it really well. Okay. So why is it sinusoidal? Because we are multiplying V in, which is a sinusoidal signal, by I in, which is another sinusoidal signal, and they are in phase with each other, and then you get actually the another sinusoidal signal which has a frequency that is has a twice the frequency of your original signal. So technically, if my signals have repeated themselves once in this period, my power is repeating itself twice in that period. So this is Vn times In. <coughs> OK, and looking at the average value, is this line over there, OK? So this is the ideal case. Now, if you look at the ideal case on the output side, You would like to have an output voltage that is totally flat, totally DC, no problem. And because, let's say, your load is also a resistive load, your output power is going to be constant. OK? Which is the same as this average value, assuming that the efficiency is 100%. So ideally, if assuming your load is a resistive load, your output voltage is supposed to be totally flat and constant, and therefore your output power will be totally flat and constant. 
So uh, if you look, if you compare the input power and the output power, you can see that they are not identical, meaning that there should be some sort of an energy storage mechanism. Like uh, over here, your, out, your input power is too much, but your output power is the average value. So you have to uh, store that in somewhere. And that's usually your output capacitor as your energy storage. So this uh, output capacitor is your energy storage as well. And then when you are in this time, basically, segment, your input power is lower than the average power. So that means that energy storage is being discharged, providing power to the load. So you can see that energy storage is sometimes getting charged and sometimes getting discharged. And because it's a capacitor, when a capacitor is being, is being charged, the voltage of the cap rises. And if it is being discharged, the voltage of the cap gets discharged. So it's actually, in a real case, your output voltage is not really flat. It is supposed to be flat, but then it has some ripple. Because it's being used as an energy storage mechanism, so sometimes it's charged, sometimes it's discharged. And the ripple is twice the line frequency. So like this ripple is 120 hertz if your signal is 60 hertz. OK? So something like this. And now, if your output voltage has some ripple, therefore your output power is going to have some ripple, because your output power is nothing but V out of squared over R. So your output power is something like this. All right. So uh, so you can argue that we are using a capacitor, but uh, this capacitor is relatively a small in size. And we will see later what I mean by a small. And then because of that, it doesn't do an excellent job eliminating this 120 hertz of ripple in the output voltage. Then you may suggest that no problem. What we are going to do is just keep increasing the size of this capacitor. So the larger the capacitor is going to be, the smaller this ripple is going to be on the output voltage. And then perfect, our output voltage is almost a, a DC output voltage, close to the ideal case. But the problem is, if you keep adding to the size of your capacitor, you are almost losing the whole concept of power factor correction. It's as if you are using a, just a passive capacitor to improve your power factor. So you're losing the concept of active power factor correction. So as a designer, don't be afraid of this 120 hertz ripple in your output voltage. Most of the times, you are using a multi kind of a stage approach. So there is going to be another converter. And that downstream converter can do a better job in terms of filtering this 120 hertz. And we have seen that earlier uh, when we were looking at like a small signal model of a buck converter, things like that. I was perturbing the input voltage, and you could see that the output voltage will, be, will not be perturbed. So as a designer, do not try to eliminate this 120 hertz. If you try to eliminate the 120 hertz, your design would not be good anymore. You are using a very large capacitor, which is the same as just using a passive capacitor instead of using an active, an active power factor com converter. Um, all right. Uh, however, the capacitor is relatively large compared to, for instance, the buck converter. Because in the buck converter, if you are using an output capacitor, or in a boost converter, in a boost, in a, like a DC-DC boost converter, uh, the capacitor is supposed to eliminate the switching frequency ripple. Here, the capacitor is not only supposed to do that, it is also tried or meant to attenuate the ripple in the output. So the capacitor in a power factor corrector is usually larger than the capacitor in a DC-DC converter, because they are meant for different purposes. One, eliminate the switching frequency. Switching frequency is high, like 100 kilohertz, no problem. A small cap can do it. Here, it's trying to eliminate 120 hertz, or attenuate to 120 hertz. So the capacitor is relatively larger. 
Now, because of that, and we are going to see later, if you look at the dynamic performance of a power factor corrector, because of the very large capacitor on the output side, it's a very a sluggish converter, OK? So the dynamic performance is very, very, very slow. OK, so let me just write these things over here. Uh, so power factor correctors uh, are meant to I would say eliminate, and but I put a question mark at the end. That means they cannot 100% eliminate um, 120 hertz ripple. Therefore, they use a large capacitor. The energy storage is sometimes it could be the inductor, but it's usually the capacitor. Okay. Okay. So the word large is a little bit defined in a like remember, large, I mean larger than the boost DC DC converter, but it's still smaller than a passive capacitor. Okay, remember that. Um, so, in order to, to emphasize on that, remember that PFCs uh, intrinsically have Uh, an output voltage ripple at double the line frequency. Okay. If you try to eliminate that ripple, Let's say we really work hard and try to eliminate it 100% to a good degree, then our solution or our design uh, would be no better than uh, passive approaches. So remember, a power factor corrector is a compromise between not using anything at all and using passive approaches in terms of the size of the components. Uh, any questions? So we're going to see in simulations how this thing actually looks like. Uh, so one question that comes in mind is, OK, how are we going to size this capacitor? We just keep talking about this capacitor is too large, too small. So we are going to have a few equations, a few general equations, to kind of give you a guideline, a kind of a ballpark number kind of a gu guideline, to come up with the right value or size for the capacitor. OK, so the question is, how can I find the right size for this cap? Um, OK, so I'm going to use this figure that you already have in your notes, uh, like V and I in the notations that are in this figure. So looking at the uh, input voltage, 
has some maximum value times, let's say, sine of omega t. And looking at the input current, it also has some peak value times sine of omega t. Therefore, the instantaneous value of the input power is Vm Im d squared of sine, which is using a trick uh, identity. So we can see in the instantaneous value of the power, there is this cosine of twice the line frequency appears. So that's where the 120 hertz comes in. And also, there is, a, there is an average value of non-zero, which is this 1 over here times Vm, Vm Im over 2. Now, we're going to do a little bit of an approximation, a little bit of a trick. I'm going to assume there is no dynamic in the system. In other words, at any given time, if I look at the input power, it's almost the same as my output power. So my input power is this. And the output power is, going back to this uh, block diagram, is the Ix, which is the output current, times Vout, which is the output voltage. OK? Now I'm going to make another assumption. And this assumption is, I'm assuming that my output voltage is almost constant. OK? Okay, it is almost constant, so now I can find Ix. Okay, as you can see, Ix has two kind of components. One of them is a DC component, or the average value. And the other one is the AC value, which is twice the line frequency. OK. So Ix, let's, let's go back to the diagram and look at Ix. Ix is the current that's being fed to the load that is placed in parallel with the capacitor. So going back to all this analysis that we had even for the buck and boost topologies, the AC content of Ix goes through the cap, and the DC content of the Ix is going to go through the load, assuming that the output voltage is almost uh, constant. So this is. This is our load current, which is I load. And it is DC because I assume that my output voltage is also DC. And this is the capacitor current. So now that we have a rough estimation for the capacitor current, I can actually integrate it and find the capacitor voltage, which is the peak-to-peak -peak ripple in the output voltage. So my cap voltage would be almost So 
So this is the DC content of my output voltage, which is basically I load times the load resistance. And then the, the AC twice the line frequency content is here too. times omega times c. We are doing some sort of an integration. That's why omega and c show, show up. And then sine of 2 omega t. OK, something like this. Um, so the first you know, uh, expression uh, is the DC content in my output voltage. The second expression is the ripple in the output voltage. So if I draw this. This is the DC content, and this is kind of the AC content. And looking at delta VC, okay, which is delta V out, VC and V out are the same basically, would be VM IM over 2 times V out times omega times c. OK? So we use it kind of similar to the buck converter. We assume everything is constant. We find the ripple, then find the peak-to-peak -peak ripple of the output voltage capacitor. This is almost the same approach. So we found delta v out. So as the designer, you know how much delta v out you need. For instance, you can say, OK, 10, 10 volt peak-to-peak -peak is OK. So your delta v out is 10, sometimes it's 20. And then you plug the numbers in and find out how much capacitor you need. And similar to before, if the capacitor, if you pick a larger and a larger and a larger capacitor, your delta V out is going to get a smaller and a smaller and smaller. One thing to note is this portion of this expression is actually your output power. So you can argue that in a power factor corrector, once you have designed the capacitor value, if your output power increases, your output ripple also increases. OK, something like that. And omega, remember, a lot of times, omega is like 2 pi um, times uh, 60. Because your line frequency is 16. And omega is not the switching frequency, remember. So we use this expression to find C. And also, you can argue that um, if your output voltage is supposed to be a variable output voltage, if you increase your output voltage, then your ripple is going to decrease, and vice versa. It's, I mean, there are some interesting features over here. So um, we made a lot of approximations, but this equation is good to give you a ballpark number in terms of what would be the right size for your capacitor. And remember, omega is only 2 pi times 60, even though the switching frequency of this converter, we haven't talked about the converter yet, uh, the switching frequency could be 100 kilohertz, but omega is the frequency of the line. So the frequency of the line is too small. Therefore, capacitor turns out to be much larger than you need if you were dealing with a buck or a boost topology and your switching frequency was a DC-DC buck or boost topology and your switching frequency was 100 kilohertz. So, so this equation basically depend on uh, how do we write the uh, output current equation? I mean, because we just... Um, we may kind of made an approximation. I mean, if you really, if you do some simulations, and really look at this output current Ix, it doesn't really have a DC component and a twice the line frequency. So it's an approximation. It depends on, we, ha we didn't even talk about what is this box over here. We didn't talk about that at all. I mean, we neglected the dynamic of this box. So um, there is a lot of approximations involved, but it gives you a very good relatively good ballpark number for the cap. So it doesn't really matter how we write this equation. We just assume Ix is Ic plus I load. I assume Ix has a DC c component that goes through I load and has a 120 hertz component that goes through the capacitor. Which is basically the same for any type of converter. 
kind of like we make the same assumption or approximation for the boost and buck boost topologies as well. That's right. Um, any other questions? Okay. So now let's talk about this box itself. What are we going to use? What, what kind of topology are we going to use? Uh, what are the best candidates in terms of topologies when it comes to power factor correction? So let's talk about that. Uh, all right, so, uh, so let me draw this one more time. So we have this bridge rectifier. On the left-hand side, we have the AC source. On the right-hand side, I just call this Vn this time. Because actually, this is the input voltage to your power factor, to your PFC. Okay, and again, emphasizing that your input's impedance would be like an like an resi equivalent resistance or a resistor emulator. Okay, so let me draw V in. Okay, V in is like rectified version of an AC signal, of an sinusoidal signal, with the peak value of Vm. OK. Now, let's look at V out. It's relatively constant, almost. OK. So if I'm trying to find the voltage transfer ratio, again, neglecting the dynamic here, the voltage um, transfer ratio, which is statically defined as V out over V in, I'll just call it M. It will be something like so there are times that your input voltage is actually very uh, small. Sometimes it's even zero. So you kind of need an, an infinite amount of gain to boost it up to a certain output voltage. So it's going to look like this. OK. So you can see that ideally you, you are looking for a converter that on the input side, it is fed by a signal that is always positive. It's not DC, but it is always positive. On the output side of this converter, you have a relatively flat DC voltage. So you're kind of looking at a DC to DC converter. And the gain, the voltage gain of DC to DC converter has a minimum of whatever this value is. all the way to very positive values of positive infinity, something like that. OK. So having this in mind, let's look at our very basic options that we are trying to consider. For instance, you may ask yourself, can I use the buck converter to do this job for me? So remember, for the buck converter, your voltage transfer ratio is between 0 and 1. Whereas here, you would like to have a voltage ratio that is above a certain number. And also, if you look at the input current, of the Bach converter, it is discontinuous. So there are two disadvantages here. Then let's consider the boost topology. Remember V out over V in in the boost topology was uh, 1 over 1 minus D. So it's always larger than 1. 
and ideally it can go all the way to very large values ideally and also your input current is continuous so it's easier to ripple uh, to filter out the switching frequency ripple content and um, let's look at the buck boost topology The voltage gain of the Bach boost topology was d over 1 minus d, so pretty much it could be anywhere, 0 all the way to infinity, and then it is discontinuous. The input current is discontinuous. Okay? So by just, just by looking at this table, we realize that the boost topology, not that you cannot use Bach or Bach boost to do power factor correction, but boost converter is better for the fact that, first of all, it is always boosting the voltage, so you can actually have your output, just set the output voltage of your PFC to be larger than the input, and perfect, you're just always boosting from input to the output. And then the current on the input side, it's the current of the inductor, it is continuous, therefore it's a little bit easier to um, filter out the switching content, switching ripple in the input current. So a lot of times in industry, we use the boost topology to do a power factor correction job for us. And we are going to see a lot of examples. Um, one thing to, now, if we happen to choose boost, remember, we need a minimum value for a gain. And boost can give you a minimum of 1, so therefore, A min has to be greater than at least one, actually, at least one. So in the boost topology, if you are using it as the as a power factor corrector, your output voltage should be larger than the peak value of the input voltage which we label this to be VM. Okay, so remember, you cannot use the regular power outlet with a 110 volts RMS, which gives you about 155 volts, and then use the boost topology to give you an output voltage of 100 volts, and uh, claim that this is doing a perfect job in, in terms of power factor correction. Okay, it doesn't. It, it has to be larger. Um, Another thing to, to note here is, I'm just going to write it and then explain it. Okay. Um, if you assume that in the boost topology that you are about to use, the voltage gain is V out over Vn, which is... something like this. Remember, Vn is the rectified version of the line voltage. Uh, if you use it this way and actually try to apply these duty cycles to your boost, you can never actually get a good operation going on because this expression neglects the dynamics of the converter. Okay, remember V out over V in is 1 over 1 minus D. It was a steady state response here. Actually, there is no steady state because your input voltage is constantly changing. So sometimes in some papers you see they have made this assumption, and sometimes it's a good assumption, or sometimes it's not a good assumption, depending on if the dynamic of the converter is important in the, in the topic of that paper or not. So please be careful if you try to use this expression for the PFC application um, it has some limitations. 
All right, so we kind of have a clear un understanding of what we want to do in terms of power factor correction. We kind of have selected our topology that suits our application the best, which is so far the boost topology. And then become, the question becomes, how are we going to be able to control our boost topology. What is the right value for the duty cycle? How are we going to determine the, the right value for the duty cycle? Well, uh, there's not a unique answer to these questions. There are so many approaches and uh, you can actually operate your boost converter in a discontinuous conduction mode and some people operate it in continuous conduction mode and we will explain why it is that people choose one uh, for another and there are so many papers out there kind of explaining how to control or even how to model the dynamic performance or the be dynamic behavior of the system. One of these papers that I would encourage you to read for next time is this paper, assuming that I have it here. Yeah, here it is. Uh, it's a relatively old paper, okay, uh, 89, 1989. And uh, it is, as you can see, it's using the boost topology here, inductor, switch, and uh, the diode. I don't know why they have put a capacitor here. Technically, you don't really need this cap. It's called filter cap. And uh, they are actually using, uh, yeah, the, the, the cap is gone. Um, they are actually using this boost in this continuous conduction mode. So we are going to actually explain it next, 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 next time on Thursday. Uh, but the paper has some interesting results. So you can see your, your converter is operating in DCM. So your input current is just going up and down a lot. So it just rises from zero, and then you turn the switch off, and then falls back to zero. But then once you do f you know, harmonic analysis of this in input current, it turns out that it has a substantial, actually, AC component in it. So it's a very simple way, and, uh, and we, as we are going to see it on Thursday, the control mechanism is very, very simple. All you have to do is to keep the on time of the switch constant. That's it. Now, how long should it be? It depends on your output voltage and output power, but as long as you figure out how much voltage you need on the output side or how much power is, needs to be consumed on the output side, you just find out a constant T on, on time for your switch, and there you are, there you go, you are in business. You just turn the switch on and off, your current goes up and down like this, and then your input current is almost in terms of fundamental harmonic sinusoidal. Also, I have posted uh, on Blackboard um, a simulation file, so if you get a chance to run it, go ahead and do that. Uh, let me just make it a little smaller. So uh, this is kind of my, this is MATLAB based, it's not Plex based. Um, this is my boost topology, okay? Um, uh, first I have my AC source, then I have a bridge of diodes, so what this bridge of diodes do is they, what it does is just regulate, uh, it just rectifies your voltage, like getting the absolute value of your voltage. So I'm actually simplifying that by just getting this absolute value of the signal. And then what's going on here is the boost converter. I think we have seen this before, how the boost operates. And uh, when it comes to duty cycle, I'm actually using a constant kind of a duty cycle, a pulse width of 28%, like a constant T on, basically. And if you look at some of the signals, this is what you will see on the output side. The very top trace is my output voltage. It is hovering around 240 volts. First of all, 240 is larger than the peak value of my input voltage, so that's good. The other thing is, as you can see, we see a significantly large ripple in the output voltage as we expected in a power factor corrector. So my Peak-to-peak -peak ripple is about, I don't know, 8 volts or 10 volts. Um, my output power, which is the bottom trace, is also fluctuating up and down as a result of that. But my, in, on average, my output power is about 680 watts. Now, the, the middle trace is the input current. So if I zoom in, 
my input current is actually discontinuous. Very, very simple, very, very simple control. I actually don't have a closed loop, actually. My, I'm just applying a constant duty cycle. So my input current is like this. So if you want to zoom it around here, you can see it's just a discontinuous input current. And uh, in terms of power factor, I have a block over here that calculates the power factor. And I can achieve a power factor of 70%. Very simple trick, very simple converter, gives you 70% of power factor, which is, which is reasonable. Uh, what else do I have here? Oh, another thing is I am plotting the input current as well as the moving average of the input current. So you can see my real input current is basically discontinuous. The red, uh, the the kind of bluish signal is the moving average of the input current. As you can see, it is almost like a sinusoidal signal. Obviously, there is some har you know harmonic distortion in it. And I've achieved this almost sinusoidal signal by using a low pass filter. So technically, if you add this filter to the input side, you can actually expect that your power grid sees that blue kind of a input current. We are going to go through this next time, but if you have time, I would encourage you to take a take a look at it, and don't don't forget about the quiz on Thursday on on Tuesday of next week, which is um, which is the matrix converters. Yes. Why would someone prefer a power electronic converter over a second harmonic, uh, second order AC filter or a first order AC filter? Okay, so the question is, why do we need to use this active power factor correction approach as opposed to a passive power factor correction correction approach? The, the answer is the size of your components are going to be smaller than the passive. So your capacitor needed and inductor needed are going to be much smaller than the passive filter. Okay, that's the main reason. Um, if you